Well, I would invite you to stand as we prepare to hear from the Word of God in Ephesians 2, uh, verses 11 through 22. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it there. In the Pew Bible, it's page 1242. Beginning then in verse 11, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you who are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in him the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks, Lord. Uh, This immeasurable grace that you've extended to us, a barrier, a wall that we could not climb over, climb around, dig under, Lord, a separation uh, from you, uh, the one that we were created to dwell with. And so we give you thanks for Christ and the work of the cross to bring us near uh, those who were once far off and alienated, Lord, from this uh, hope and grace. We pray for Pastor Trent, God. We give you thanks for him, uh, his family. We pray that you would strengthen him now, Lord, to deliver your word to us and that by the Spirit you would allow us to receive it and be transformed by it to do what we are unable to do in and for ourselves in Christ name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It was June 12th, 1987, and President Ronald Reagan was standing in front of a concrete wall about 100 yards away a wall that stood to divide East and West Berlin. On the day when he stood in front of this wall to make his speech, the wall had been standing there for nearly 26 years. It started as just a bunch of barbed wire and some armed guards, but over the course of time, it developed into a full-on concrete structure complete with guard towers and By this point, some 140 people had been killed trying to cross the wall. The the, the practical reason for the wall was precisely to keep the impoverished people in East Germany from crossing over into the freedom and opportunity on the West side, and it had largely been effective. But the wall was also a symbol. And the wall was a symbol of the division that existed in the world throughout the Cold War period between communism and democratic freedoms. At the time that Reagan stood there to make his speech that day, the tide was beginning to turn. Up to this point, the three previous presidential administrations prior to Reagan had been content to let the wall stand in hopes of developing a better relationship with the Soviets. But Reagan, against the counsel of his counselors in the State Department and the National Security Council, felt that this status quo could not continue any longer. 
And so while previous administrations had, men- had avoided mentioning the wall in any kind of direct way, Reagan went straight at it. That day, he delivered what was perhaps the most significant speech of his entire presidency. And somewhere around the midway point, he delivered these words. He said, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. And if you watch it live, there's a long applause right here. This is your cue for applause. Where is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but then the most famous words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Tear down this wall. Perhaps again, some historians say the four most important words of his presidency. So how did people respond? How did the world respond when Reagan uttered these words? Well, basically, they took very little notice of what he said. The media hardly covered this at all. Western pundits wrote it off as Reagan being an idealist, not dealing with reality. Even Gorbachev himself, who was later interviewed, said this about it. He said, we really were not impressed. We knew that Mr. Reagan's original profession was actor. (laughs) Pretty stunning Response, And yet, within about two years, by November of 1989, people had come out with chisels and hammers, crowbars, and within a matter of weeks, the wall was demolished. It had been torn down. All because of one man's conviction that this dividing wall can't stand anymore. All because of one man's willingness to be written off as an idealist, to be laughed at by his enemies, His conviction was this wall can't stand anymore. In our passage today, we read about another man who shares a similar conviction. And his conviction is that there is a dividing wall that absolutely can't stand anymore in light of what Christ has done. Now, it's not a dividing wall that separates communists and those who believe in democracy, but it's any wall that separates the followers of Jesus Christ from one another. In the particular context, the Apostle Paul is talking about the dividing wall of hostility that existed in the first century between Jewish and Gentile believers. And Paul is making the case in this passage that in light of what Christ has done, that wall cannot be there anymore, nor any of the ramifications of that wall. It must be torn down. But by implication, if the wall that God appointed to stand between Jews and Gentiles needed to come down, then likewise, any wall that exists among God's people erected by men must absolutely come down, whether those walls are racial or ethnic or by language or by generation or by economic abilities. Whatever walls stand between God's people must come down. Here's the point. Because Christ's reconciling work on the cross has broken down every dividing wall between Christians, we must live as one people reconciled to God and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Like Reagan, whenever we see walls standing between people who call Jesus their Savior and Lord, we must say, tear down this wall. If what Christ accomplished at the cross is true, then we have to say and bring out our sledgehammers and chisels and crowbars. This wall also must come down because there are to be no divisions among those who are called by God's name, those who are his temple. So we're gonna look at this passage under two headings. First of all, how we were and then how we are. First of all, the way we were. Look with me at verse 11. Paul's speaking to a primarily Gentile audience, and this is what he says. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. And we have to pause here for a moment because what Paul is doing is he's addressing the reality 
that these Gentiles are facing. Namely, they are the object of name calling. The, the Jews in the first century refer to them as the uncircumcision, which of course is true, but you might wonder what in the world difference does that make? Well, for the Jewish people from the days of Abraham, circumcision was the mark of identification with God's people. If you were one of God's people, you bore this mark in your body or you were related to a man who bore this mark in their body. And so all of the world, it's strange for us to think of all the world being divided into two categories and these being the two, but this is how the Jewish mind saw the world from the days of Abraham. There was the circumcised and there was the uncircumcised. But what Paul, who is part of that circumcised group, the point he makes in this, what he's, what he's beginning to make in this passage is, those who are calling you the uncircumcised, they have merely experienced the circumcision that is made by hands. And the implication is there's another circumcision. And he refers to it in other passages. And it's the true circumcision that the physical circumcision was merely a pointer toward. It's a circumcision of the heart. It's a transformation that God does inside of a person. That's the one that matters, but he digresses. And so he comes back to his point in verse 12. He says, remember you Gentiles that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is the position of every non-Jewish person from the beginning until the time of Christ. Separated from God, not connected with any of those great covenants we read about in the Old Testament with Abraham and Moses and David. Specifically, having no hope and without God in the world. Imagine, if you can today, what it would be like not to have a personal relationship with the living God. Imagine thinking that you are in this world on your own, that your best hope would be that people will do the right thing, that your best hope would be that things will just turn out right in the end. Your best hope would be that maybe someday all of this will add up to mean something. Imagine going through life in this world knowing that you're guilty. Knowing that you've done things that cross boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. Whatever your standard of morality is, knowing that you haven't lived up to it. And what are you going to do with that? With that sense of guilt? besides just try to press it down and ignore it and hope it doesn't come up. Imagine not knowing that there is a way for your sin to be taken away and your guilt atoned for. You see, because humans across all cultures and across all of history are aware of this <laughs> sense of guilt. You could go anywhere on the planet and you can discover how people have tried to deal with the fact that they know they are guilty, but they don't know what to do with it. Before this, this was the position of every Gentile. This would have been all of your position. And maybe it is some of your position today. We know that there are still in this world, right now as we speak, more than 2,000 years after Christ died and was rose again, we know there are billions of people who have never heard the good news about what Jesus has done for us. This is why we're wanting to send $3 million out there through Faith Promise Pledge, because we want as many people near and far to hear the message about Jesus as we can possibly get the word out because it's a shame. It should break our hearts that there are people without God, without hope in this world. It's the reason why we want to plant a church in East Collier County, because you may not believe this, but there are people out there and probably people even in your own development who've heard the name of Jesus, but they don't know anything about the good news about what Jesus has done. They've heard about church, but they don't know anything about Jesus. 
the good news. And again, probably some of you here today are in that category, and we're glad you're here. But it may be a little bit offensive to say, you're without God and you're without hope in the world. That's kind of a harsh judgment. And yet what the Bible says, and this is what we go by, the Bible says that apart from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we can't have any kind of a relationship with God. It's specifically through Jesus that we can know God and that we can know hope. So let me ask you, all of you, what is the hope that sustains you in life today? You may be sustained today by a short-term hope, by a hope that you're going to get through school right now. Or maybe it's the hope that you're going to get through some particular physical challenge that you're dealing with. Or maybe that you're going to get through a particularly rough period of your career. And those are all fine hopes. The question is, though, what if those hopes don't come to fruition? What's your hope then? Or perhaps your hope is with regard to your children. You hope that your children will grow up, that they will be healthy, that they will be happy, that they'll be successful, however you define success, which are wonderful things for us to desire for our children. But what happens if that doesn't happen? What is your hope then if things don't turn out for your children? Do you have a hope that goes beyond that? Or maybe your hope just for yourself is that you'll have a financial windfall or that you'll be able to enjoy a peaceful retirement or that you'll just be able to have a sense of, of peace with yourself, that you'll just be happy as you go down to the grave, that tomorrow will be better than today. And, and my question for you is what if tomorrow doesn't come? What is your hope then? You see, all of these hopes that we have that carry us in the world are all contingent on something happening. But Christianity offers a hope that's not contingent on some future event. It's contingent upon something Jesus has already done. And so it is an anchor for your soul. It is something that can keep you firm and steady through all of the storms of life, no matter how things pan out in the days to come. The Christian hope is a hope that truly is now in this world enough to carry you, but not just in this world, beyond it as well. And if you don't know that hope, you can know that hope through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's extended to all. The people that Paul is talking to here are people who have embraced that hope. And so he can not only talk about the way we were, but the second thing he can talk about is the way we are. And so he continues in verse 13, drawing the distinction between the way we were and the way we are. And this is what he says. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. If you are in Christ Jesus, we've seen this language repeatedly through Ephesians. It means you are, you have been, you've been brought into a relationship with him. Specifically, you who once were far off. He's talking about Gentiles. Any non-Jewish people in the crowd, you were part of that category that was once far off from God. But now, in Christ, something has happened to you. You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The... The language here is not unimportant. He doesn't say, you who were far off drew near to God. He says, you who were far off have been brought near. Through the blood of Christ, the the emphasis throughout the book of Ephesians is what God has done to bring you near to him. What God has done specifically through Christ's sacrificial work on the cross to bring a people who were far off who could not come, who would not come to bring them near. If you are near him, it is because God brought you near by the blood of Jesus. And he goes on in verse 14. For he himself, that is Christ, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 
Now, this is a, something of a complicated passage that we're gonna look at in more detail, but the, the, the big picture of what he's saying here is what God has done in Christ to break down the hostility that existed between God and man and the hostility that existed between Jewish and Gentile believers and by implication, all believers. So the first thing he says is that Christ himself is our peace. And here's what he means by that. Verse 14 again, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. What is this dividing wall of hostility? The dividing wall of hostility is probably a reference to a literal wall about four and a half feet high that stood out in the temple courtyard, dividing the courtyard of the Gentiles from the inner parts of the temple complex that were only available for those who were circumcised, those who were Jews. That four foot wall is appropriately called a wall of hostility because archeologists have found that inscribed on this wall in 13 different places are these words. No foreigner, read Gentile, is to enter within the forecourt and the balustrade around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. Now, this is not a knock on the Jewish people. This is God's instruction. The Gentiles are not to come near. Even the Jews were not to come near past a certain point. There was hostility, not only between Jews and Gentiles, but between God and man. And therefore, there were these fences that existed to protect Jewish contact with Gentile people, but anybody's contact with God himself. And so this wall of hostility stood there, but the wall of hostility was more than just a wall. The the wall itself was a picture of a deeper reality. And Christ deals with that deeper reality that separates Jews and Gentiles and ultimately that separates all people from God in this way in verse 15. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two. But Christ came, it says, to abolish the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Well, what laws did Christ come to abolish. Does this mean that the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments laid down in the Old Testament scripture that Christ came and abolished that law? I don't believe so. And the reason for that is because we know the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments is a reflection of God's unchanging character. We can no more abolish God's moral law than we can abolish God himself. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So in what sense can Paul say that that Christ came and abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances? It's a little bit complicated. I believe this is what the apostle Paul is talking about. He specifically has in mind those laws that were created by God that existed to separate the Jewish people from the Gentile people because they were to be a holy people. And what is holy is not to have contact with that which is unclean. And the Gentiles were unclean. And so there were a number of laws that existed to keep a firm separation. And along with those laws came a certain amount of animosity and even hatred between the two groups. For example... God commanded all of his people to have the mark of circumcision in their bodies. That was a very strong dividing line that divided all of humanity into two groups at that time. Well, Christ, through his work on the cross, has fulfilled what circumcision was pointing toward. He experienced the circumcision of having put off his body to make his people clean, Paul says in Colossians. And so it's no longer necessary for the mark of circumcision to be placed on the body. That's no longer a dividing line among God's people. 
There was also very strict dietary laws that existed in the law that the Jewish people needed to abide by. And the effect of these dietary laws is that you could have no table fellowship between Jew and Gentile. Well, as we read, the work of Christ at the cross ultimately has done away with those food laws. And Peter himself received a vision from God telling him that those Gentiles are no longer unclean and there are no longer clean and unclean foods. But the purpose for which those laws existed have been fulfilled through the ministry of Christ. He is the one who sanctifies his people and makes them holy and distinguishes them from the world, not one's diet. So now there's no longer that wall there. The sacrificial system, access to God in the temple. As we said, the Gentiles had to stay out. Jews could come forward. They could bring their sacrifices to God. They could enter into the the holy place. Only one Jew could enter into the holy of holies, the high priest, and that only once a year. But when Christ came... He himself became the sacrifice. He himself became the high priest. He himself became the temple. He's the one who broke down all of the walls that were separating sinful humanity from the holy God. And he, his blood and his sacrificial work avails not only for Jewish believers, but for Gentiles as well. The sacrificial system is no longer there because what the sacrificial system was pointing toward has come in the flesh and finished the work. Through Christ's work, he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. There now is no reason for Jew and Gentile to be separated whatsoever. He has, he's, he's done away with it. Why? Because this is his aim, verses 15 and 16. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. They're no longer in God's kingdom, the Gentile and the Jew, as two different groups of people. But now, in Christ, we've all been reconciled to God in one body, in the body of Christ. There is now the church of Jesus Christ comprised of Jewish and Gentile background believers, but no longer any dividing wall between them. The church is one. It's hard for us to appreciate just how high that wall of hostility was in the first century. Most of us maybe don't even know a Jewish background believer or a modern day Jew living in an orthodox or ultra-orthodox way. But if you go to Jerusalem, you can get a little bit of experience if you get close to an ultra-orthodox Jewish person. You probably can't get close because they're very cognizant of you. Even after Peter has a vision from God that says, don't call common or or unclean what I've called clean. And he was eating and enjoying table fellowship with Gentile Christians. Even he was influenced by other Jewish background believers to go back to having a dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. So that the apostle Paul had to go and confront him to his face and say that your unwillingness to eat with Gentile believers runs contrary to what the gospel proclaims. And to his credit, Peter repents and he tears down that wall again and enjoys table fellowship with Gentile believers. But the wall was real. And it was very difficult for believers to overcome. And yet they did because they recognized that if Christ has reconciled us both to God through his one body, then there can't remain any divisions among the people who are in Christ. And if that's true, with a wall that God himself built, how much more so is it true with the walls we've built between one another? The point is that if Christ has broken down the God-made division between believers, we should not allow any man-made divisions to remain standing between us. Race, 
age, ethnicity, our, our, our home language, our home country, even who we might vote for, even where we live, our zip code, our gates, no division among those who are one in the body of Christ. That's the unique thing that the church is in this world. It's a varied group of people from every tongue, tribe, language, and nation with all kinds of varying perspectives. But one thing they share in common, that Jesus Christ came, he died for his people to take away our sins. He rose again from the dead. He reigns from heaven and he's coming again. And in the meantime, we are called to live as one and proclaim to the world the wall-destroying power of the cross. a power that was able to break down even the wall that stood between us and the holy God. He says in verse 17, Christ came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. This is a reference to Isaiah 57 and what Paul is saying is that when Christ came through him and ultimately through the apostolic ministry, The good news was preached to the Gentiles who were far off, to the Jews who were near, that all might participate and be a part of this one body. And he goes on in verse 18, for through him, that is Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. All of us, Jewish, Gentile, wherever you might be from, there's one spirit who fills all of God's people. And through that spirit, we all have access to the one father. All the dividing walls must come down. He goes on with the, the, more, more of the implications in verse 19 and following. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Again, hard for us to appreciate, but if you're a refugee who was forced to leave your homeland, and you're living as a refugee in a foreign land, and you're treated as a foreigner in that land, maybe despised and hated in that land, and then one day you're granted citizenship, and you're declared part of this country. You're declared part of this people. Maybe even beyond that, you're actually part of a family, a household. What good news that would be for you. And what Paul says is that's precisely your position. As Gentiles, you were refugees from God, but you've been brought into his household. You've been declared fellow citizens with his people. Built on the, verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we have this picture now of the people of God comprised of Jewish and Gentile believers being built into a temple kind of complex. And what was the purpose of the temple or what is the purpose of any temple? Well, in the Old Testament specifically, the purpose of the temple was to be the dwelling place of God. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant stood, which was to be considered his footstool. It was where God's presence was concentrated more densely than anywhere else on the planet. And so therefore, the access to that place was greatly restricted. But now he says God's building another temple, another dwelling place. And this is what he says about it in verse 20 and 21, that it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself, being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The ministry of the gospel through the prophets and the apostles is the foundation upon which God is building this new building. The cornerstone of the building, the most important building, the reference for the whole building, which gives the whole building its shape is Christ Jesus himself. And this building God is building is made of living stones comprised of Jewish and Gentile background believers, again, from people all over the globe. He's building up this building, the church, to be his dwelling place where he himself concentrates his presence more densely than anywhere else on the planet. 
Again, verse 22, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That place in the temple where no one else could go but the high priest and that just once per year. You collectively are that place. And not just you in this room, but believers from around the world. We are that place where God chooses to cause his presence to dwell in a way that it does not dwell in any other place. This is why I don't share the view of some, maybe some of you in this room, that, uh, that the Jewish people should anticipate the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem at some point in the future. And the reason why I don't share that view is because it runs quite backwards from the direction of redemptive history. God's intention is not to revert back to dwelling again in a temple made by human hands. His intention is to indwell a church, not a building, a people with his presence and that those people would fill the whole earth and therefore his glory will fill the earth forever and ever. And a temple made of living stones with Christ Jesus himself and his work being the cornerstone of that whole building. And so, brothers and sisters, this is, this is where history is moving. This is what God is doing in the church. And that has some direct implications for us. I want to challenge you this week to ask yourself sincerely, are there any dividing walls that stand between me and another follower of Jesus Christ. It might be that there's a dividing wall because of some racial feelings you have toward a particular group of people. I'm not just talking about black and white, race issues go all across the spectrum. There are feelings that we harbor toward other people based on experiences we've had or perceptions that we have that can form a division between us. Tear down that wall. It has no place. If what Christ did is true, that wall has no place. Maybe even demonstrate your conviction that you believe that through the cross of Christ, he smashed every dividing wall by reaching out to a person who maybe speaks a different language than you. Maybe they're from a different country than you. Maybe they're a different color than you. Maybe they have a different political conviction about the future of our country than you do. Let me encourage you to reach out to them and just see if you might share dinner together. And in the course of that dinner, I'm not saying you ought to talk about those differences. <laughs> that is risky. But what I am saying is, why don't you talk about what you share in common? That you believe Jesus Christ died for you and that he's building you together into a holy temple in the Lord. And that whatever other differences we have, this thing that holds us together is far more significant. Maybe there's a dividing wall of bitterness and unforgiveness or resentment that you have built towards someone else because of something that they've done to you or something that you perceive. Brothers and sisters, this wall must come down as well. If God has reconciled us to himself in Christ, forgiving our offenses against him, then we too must forgive one another. The walls that stand between us must come down. Next week, we're going to celebrate communion. It is a picture of what we're talking about in this passage. It's a wonderful week to call up that person. It could be a parent, it could be a child, it could be a friend. And to own your part in the building of that wall. To say, I'm sorry. Here's what I did, here's how I've contributed, I'm sorry. I want this wall to come down. I believe that what Jesus did is enough for me to forgive you, for you to forgive me and for us to be able to live at peace together and for there to be no interruption, no dividing wall that would keep the spirit from flowing freely in this building he's constructing. 
It may be that you are aware of a wall that exists between two believers or maybe two groups of believers. And the scripture says, blessed are the peacemakers because nobody else is gonna bless you. <laughs> but God may be calling you to step into a conflict that's not your own because your heart's grieved to see two people who share Christ in common at war with one another. And he may be calling you to step into that situation and to help them to grasp how the good news of the cross is enough to break down any wall that stands between us. There is more than enough grace to forgive any sin. More than enough grace to humble ourselves to ask for that forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, if Christ has come and if he's broken down this dividing wall, then wherever we see dividing walls, we must take the message of that cross and tear down those walls. If you've not experienced reconciliation with God yourself, I just wanna encourage you to be reconciled to God. Through the cross, Jesus, he tore the veil that separated people from himself, even the Jewish people. And now all of us, through faith in Jesus, can be reconciled to God. And having experienced that reconciliation, we can be reconciled with one another. If you have experienced that reconciliation, then let me encourage you to live out the implications of it. Particularly this year, as we've said, the world is going to show a whole lot of division. But may we as the body of Christ who have varying perspectives on national politics and so on, may we demonstrate a unity in our conviction about the cross as one temple in whom God's spirit dwells that far surpasses the divisions that might exist between us. Would you pray with me to that end? Lord, we praise you that you did what was necessary to bring us near through the blood of Christ. Thank you for the privilege of being reconciled to you and being part of the household of God, being part of the temple that you're building in which your glory dwells. Lord, wherever we have dividing walls between us today or in our hearts, help us to apply the truth of the gospel and tear down those walls. May we be a congregation and may your church across this land and across the world demonstrate the tremendous power of the cross to reconcile divided people and to make us one, that our very oneness would be a testimony to the world that Christ has conquered. Help us to live in the light of these truths. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.